Welcome everyone to our Spring 2022 series of OTF Connects webinars entitled Supporting Teacher Efficacy and Student Engagement. My name is Peter Beans and I'm honored to be your moderator for today's session with Leanne Oliver and Trish Mecker entitled Strategies for Student Ownership of Learning, Part 1 of 2. Before we begin, I'd like to do a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge we are gathered in the traditional territories of various Indigenous peoples, and we further recognize our duty to support the achievement of the calls to actions, stemming from the recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. Before we begin, I'd like to welcome Leanne Oliver and Trish Mecker. Leanne currently serves as a classroom math teacher and curriculum chair of mathematics at All Saints Catholic Secondary School in the Durham Catholic District School Board. As a co-creator of UP, which is Ultimate Potential Math, Leanne has a growth mindset and believes that with the proper support, each and every student can achieve their ultimate potential. Leanne's past participation in several provincial TLLP and international learning projects has taught her the critical value of teacher collaboration and deprivatized classroom environments. Leanne's most recent learning has focused on developing and implementing classroom practices that address and honor the role of assessment in supporting growth mindset and student ownership of learning. Leanne has shared her learning at various provincial and international conferences. Trish Mecker is an experienced classroom teacher currently working at All Saints Catholic Secondary School in the Durham Catholic District School Board. Trish has served as a lead and participant in several TLLP projects as well as NORCAM, an international project that brought together educators from Ontario, Alberta, and Norway in a quest to improve the educational experience of students in the math classroom. As an ultimate potential math teacher, Trish understands the value of growth mindset and targeted planning and supporting and helping students to overcome obstacles to learning. Trish's most recent learning has centered on building assessment practices that honor mistakes and nurture the growth mindset of her students. Trish is also a strong believer in the impact of deprivatized classrooms and teacher course teams on collective teacher efficacy in a school community. Trish has shared her learning at various provincial and international conferences. So let's turn it over to Leanne and Trish. Welcome. Thank you. So just to be clear, I'm Leanne, and I am absolutely thrilled to be here and thankful for OTF to providing, for providing us this opportunity to share. Hi, and I'm Trish, and we want to thank you um, for joining us today. Uh, thank you, Peter, for the introduction. Um, as Peter mentioned, um, Leanne and I have been privileged to work on several OTF TLLP projects, as well as the, an international math equity project that was called NORCAN. And we're both currently working at a school in Whitby in the Durham Catholic um, District School Board called All Saints Catholic School. Uh, but that's not how we started. Um, so we're going to share our story. But um, for the majority of our careers, Leanne and I worked at different schools. And it wasn't actually until the year 2016 that we met each other um, as a result of our board implementing um, a math program called UP Math at all schools in our board. So it was through this program that Leanne and I began to um, work together. We collaborated on several projects, but we were still working at um, different schools. And we really wanted to mention this right away at the start of our presentation um, because we firmly believe in the power of teacher collaboration. So we're so thrilled that you joined us today and um, we can hopefully collaborate together. Um, we believe in collaboration so much uh, that um, when the opportunity presented itself, Leanne and I both transferred to All Saints so that we could um, work together. Okay, so one of our goals with this webinar this afternoon is to provide you with the opportunity um, to collaborate with different teachers, um, maybe from different schools or from different school boards, um, and start to develop your own um, professional learning network outside of our own school areas. Um, 
every opportunity that Leanne and I have had uh, to share our learning has only deepened our learning. And we are so blessed. We are so thankful for all of the collaboration that's um, resulted in in learning relationships across the province. So thank you for showing up today. I know it's hard if <laughs> you've had a full school day, which we both had this morning or today. Um, so we really wanted to thank you and, and looking forward to hopefully developing a collaborative um, working relationship with you. We also wanted to thank OTF for providing us with this opportunity. So we'd like to get started today with a quote, and this is something that we have adapted from something written by Maya Angelou. So it says, I've learned that students will forget what I said and students will forget the details of what they learned, but students will never forget the way I made them feel when I empowered them to own their learnings. So you can see that we have modified that. We thought that this was an important tone to set as we begin, simply because it does talk about owning their learning. And as we go through, and we'll start today by just sharing our, our past history and kind of what has brought us to this point, because we're hopeful that will be helpful to you. You're going to see that ownership is something that we talk about quite a bit. The other part of this quote that we felt was important is that it does talk about the way that students are feeling. And we understand that students are complete people and therefore that their emotional uh, aspect that they're bringing to the classroom is really, really important. And for this reason, we're actually going to start um, by asking you to participate in a Minds-On activity um, that is in the form of a Padlet. So I have placed the link to the Padlet in the chat. And in this Padlet, we are going to ask you to share things that you are grateful for. You might be wondering why we're asking you to do something like this. Um, especially given that Trish and I are actually secondary math teachers. And what we have found um, is that many times our students are really struggling with anxiety. And this is the one of the things that is impairing our students' ability to fully engage in learning. Um, and we've discovered um, through various um, investigations and various research reviews that we've done that the area in the brain where students are feeling anxiety is actually the same area of the brain where we experience gratitude. And the cool thing is that you can't do two things at once, despite um, these misconceptions about multitasking, we actually can't. Um, so we'd like to practice that today. So you'll notice after you um, go to that link, is everyone able to see the link? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Hopefully we can see the link. If you click on that, it will take you to the page that Trish is sharing. You'll notice in the bottom right corner of the screen, there's a little pink plus sign. If you click on that, it will allow you to add something that you're grateful for. And this is a practice that we do quite often in our classroom, all the way from grade nine to grade 12. And the power of it is fantastic. So we begin by modeling this for our students. And an interesting sidebar is that at the beginning, they're kind of wondering what's happening. By the end, they come to build this gratitude habit. So we'll just give you a moment, if you would be so kind, is to perhaps share. I'm thankful for OTF because it's provided us with, so that would be an exemplar of something I'm thankful for. I'm thankful for my family. I'm thankful I had food to eat today. I'm thankful for an awesome colleague and friend like Trish. I'm thankful for the opportunity to, to meet you all today. So those are examples of things that we could be sharing or more personal things about our own families. So we'll just give you a moment to try to access that and populate it. I'm wondering, Leanne, if... Um, yeah. Do I need to send the link again, maybe? I'm not sure. Is everyone able to access the, the Padlet? Oops, just a second. I, 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 sorry. Can uh, you... There can I, I was can I, Take the last yeah. one, there we go. The last one I sent, I apologize, that's for our next link. The one at the top is the Padlet, please. There. 
you know what I also had to do? I think I had to refresh my screen because nothing was showing up. And and when I went out there and I refreshed, so maybe I'll have to Um, do that. No, it says awaiting approval. Awaiting approval for for somebody, which is oh, which is a little strange. Oh, there we go. Perfect. Okay, we we you know this is like real time classroom work, right, guys? This was our padlet Thank for. You. From Thank school. you for your patience with me as I. Uh... <laughs> okay. So thank you for sharing with that. Um, Hopefully this is a strategy and we'll talk about it a little bit later as well. But there is lots of research that supports using gratitude. Um, The really cool thing is Chris, uh, Trish and I are not psychologists. So we recognize that this was a mental health concern and anxiety concern. This is something we can implement in our classrooms that will actually do no harm, (laughs) right? Being untrained psychologists, it's something that just really fits nicely into our days. So something to consider perhaps. Perfect. Okay, let me just go back. And we're going to ask you for a little bit more um, engagement right now. Our our, uh, series today is on um, student engagement. And um, before we share any um, of our learnings, how we implemented strategies for student engagement, we would like you to share um, what does student engagement look like for you? Okay, so on the screen, you will see a QR code again. You can use your phone to just scan that with your camera and it should bring you, this time we're gonna try some sharing with a Wordle. Um, I think Leanne is also placing the link in the chat. So she's giving me a thumbs up there. So the Wordle will ask you to enter three words or phrases that describe what student engagement looks like for you. So we'll give you an opportunity to do that. And I will bring up the Wordle as it populates. Hmm. And just to share with you, the tool we're using for our Wordle is Mentimeter. So um, we use that often with our students also. Um, we've used this at the start of, uh, of a semester and just ask them, um, how do you feel about starting math this semester? Um, Mentimeter is it's very easy to just set it up very quickly. Um, and you can see the results change as students enter things in there. This is fantastic. We were really interested to see some of the things that you think about um, when we talk student engagement. This is a great tool as well, even for gathering data in our classrooms. Um, Sometimes we ask our students at the beginning of the semester their ideas about um, different things that are happening in the classroom, how they feel about learning, um, and then and produce a wordle and then see it at the end, and we can really see uh, the flow. So as we move through and chat today, one of the things we're going to talk about is how can we collect data, whether formal or informal data, to kind of measure changes that are happening because when we do that then we know whether or not we are actually making change in our classroom so I really like this one Trish because it's a great easy fun one um, and it produces that product that we can see and when I look at it right now I I see lots of different ideas but um as you populate this, this um, Wordle, the words that come up multiple times um, from different users um, begin to grow larger. So the one that's sticking out to me right in the middle there is that word of excitement, right? Mm-hmm. Fantastic. But lots of different ideas, right? Lots of different ideas. I think it's really interesting. Um, We have such a wide variety of ideas, Mm -hmm. which really does fit um, with what we've experienced in terms of what engagement actually is. Um, Because, you know, when we started our careers, we might have thought differently about how we feel now. 
So I'm wondering if everybody's had a chance to enter their thinking there, Trish. Perhaps. Yeah, I think perhaps. Um, maybe there are still some that haven't. How we're um, just to let you know, as we go through this presentation today, we are so open um, to you um, participating as we go. So if you have any <laughs> questions or things that you want to share, um, really, it's a really important part of what we, we would like to do today. Leanne, Absolutely. are you monitoring the chat? Yeah. Yeah, I'm not seeing anything in the chat yet. So okay. I think we can probably head forward, Trish. Okay. Yeah. So one of the things we consider when we look at, a, at this is kind of what we notice and what we wonder, which are two great questions that you've probably heard before um, because it really stimulates student thinking and it stimulates um, them engaging in the learning and, and trying to put their own stamp on what was what is happening. Oh, we are getting some more there, Trish. Yeah, awesome. I have to be careful not to look too forward. I realize I, I almost had my eye. <laughs> That's what I'm happened. Too. If you see me right in like this. So yeah. So you'll have, have to forgive today. these old ladies, okay? <laughs> we we I think we were going to put in our original um, <laughs> Uh, description over 50 years of combined teaching experience, you know, from our rocking chairs. So yeah, it's hard for us to see the screen. Wise ladies. Oh, Lisa, you're so sweet. <laughs> oh, Lisa. Okay. Hi, Lisa. Yeah, hi, Lisa. Yeah, that's our Lisa. <laughs> Okay, I think we can probably head forward, Trish, and maybe yeah. kind of uh, pull these ideas together a little bit. Thank you so much for participating, everybody. Um, it's just like in a classroom, right, that we all know. It's yeah. so much better um, to get your thoughts as we move forward. Um, did you want me to go back to the um, presentation, or do we want yes. to have this on here when we talk about... Yeah, okay, okay. I think we can go back to our presentation okay. unless... So one of the things um, as you've looked at that is kind of what you're noticing and what you're wondering. And as I was looking through those, and I think that Trish, you can attest to this and maybe other people can kind of voice in as well, is that there were different types of engagement. And in our experience, we've come to call them two by two different names to really articulate um, that we're looking for particular types of engagement. So if we want to go forward there, um, it's really about passion passive engagement and active engagement. Um, so I remember when I first started my teaching career, um, I remember being um, assessed and one of the look for's way back then was, are they sitting um, in their seats? Are they paying attention? And by engagement, um, it was perceived that if they weren't talking to their neighbor, that they were engaged. Of course, looking back at that now, I shake my head and think, oh my goodness, um, how untrue that was. And that's just a real learning that's evolved over almost 30 years. And what I think we saw in our Wordle that our participants created, Trish, is that they really identified that engagement is something that, that can be active. Yeah. And I even saw loud classroom there, which, which now yeah. we've come to realize that that's actually a really good yeah. thing. When it's quiet, I'm really uncomfortable now, um, you know, when the students aren't making noise and, and moving about. So I think that that's just a really important idea. I don't know that we really need to address it anymore because I feel like this group is kind of on the same wavelength with what we've experienced. I don't know, Trish, if, if you have yeah. anything more to say about that. No, I agree. I I saw um, in the Wordle, I saw the word active, and I, I think um, that to me meant that the students were active. They were engaged that way, right? But I think we're um, going to talk about um, what we found as being um, strategies that really promoted active engagement right our students and and we are going to maybe hopefully take it one step further and, and show you that active engagement for us means that our students are owning their learning like when we go into our classroom we see students learning from each other um and they own it 
So I think um, really, really quickly, uh, we just want to tell you a brief overview of where we began, um, because I think it informs where our learnings came from. So the year was actually 2009, um, when 17% of the students at my school had achieved level three or more on their grade nine EQAO numeracy assessment. So this was really startling to us. Um, and clearly the data was showing that there was a problem with engagement of students Students. There was a problem with the learning, but we had to recognize and face the facts that student engagement was a problem. So one of the first things that we did is took this data and actually um, connected it to the faces in our classroom to see what the real problem with that data was. And when we made that effort, we started to see that we needed to do a lot of different things in order to make this engagement change. And using that idea, um, we applied for several TLLP grants, and we were able to develop a program called UP, or Ultimate Potential Math, that Peter spoke about. We're not going to go into a lot of detail about this program, but as a result of its learnings, it allowed us to reverse and transform this data so that it became about 71% about four years later. So we mentioned this because data can be important. If we had not been measuring our learning and our student learning, then we wouldn't have really identified the fact, hey, we're onto something here. You know, we've thrown, we've tried so many different things. This actually worked. So that was an important part of what happened with that. Um, if, so UP Math, just as I said, we're not really going to go into a lot of detail. Um, it's a program that we developed that runs in semester one of high school for mathematics students. And um, students are invited to participate into this in this program. And we look at engaging students and helping to remediate numeracy gaps so that they then take their desired mathematics course in semester two. As we moved through and developed this program, the question was always, okay, this is great. This is working at the school I was at, which was a very socioeconomically challenged school that had very unique needs. So as this program was adopted across our school board and even shared across the province, the question remained, are these strategies going to be transferable? We mentioned this because this was actually Trisha's school. And you see um, when UP Math was implemented in 16, 17, um, the dramatic increase that we saw in student achievement. So that was confirmation of something happening here that we needed to really try to tease apart and articulate so that we could replicate it in our other courses as well. Um, so one of the big parts of the UP math program was changing students mindset. We talked a lot a bit, a lot about growth mindset and um, math mindset and making these students believe, uh, believe in their ability. Or, and it wasn't just um, the students mindset that changed, but we also found a significant shift was needed in the teacher mindset. Um, so that was a big part of our learning also. And we wanted to share right away now again, that as our UP math was um, implemented board wide, the UP math teachers um, from the different schools started to form their own learning team. Um, we were very blessed that our, our board privileged the learning that we were doing, and they did that by giving us release time to collaborate together. So we began to team teach in each other's classes. And um, Leanne's already alluded to our, our numbers of years of, of, of teaching practice. And um, I, that was something that I had never done as a secondary teacher Um the, the idea of team teaching was was foreign to me, but we started to do this all of the time. And uh, we saw a real deprivatization of our classrooms. Um, it was almost infectious, the um, desire to work together. And in terms of promoting a growth mindset with our students, when they saw us as teachers working together, um, we were modeling that for them, right? That everyone learns from everyone else. Uh, so this photo right here just shows um, 
the UPMath learning team, we started to um, present at different conferences um, and different boards. And like I said, the learning became contagious. And if we look back at the success of this program, we really believe that the teacher collaboration that took place was a crucial part of that puzzle. It really was for us. Um, it led to Leanne and I applying for another TLLP um, project. Um, and even though we were still at different schools, right? Um, I don't know if you've ever worked with people at different schools. It's very hard in a school day to collaborate together. Um, so even though we were at different schools, um, we did apply for a TLLP project. We really want to focus on the collaboration piece um, in terms of of getting our students engaged was us working together. We've already told you that it was so important to us that after teaching, I was teaching 25 years at Austin before I changed um, to the school that I'm at now so that Leanne and I could work together. So we really want to encourage you today to, to make connections with teachers um, that are doing the same learning as you, okay? Might be sometimes hard to find those people, but like we were just talking about it before the, the presentation today, People come into your life at a certain time and, and you're meant to work together. So um, from our experience, the collaboration that you can do with other pe people would be transformational to your teaching practice. And sometimes that's hard to make happen. Yeah. Um, yes. And so something that is maybe worth trying is speaking with your administrator, speaking with your principal and saying, I would really like to co-teach to deprivatize my classroom and actually work in the classroom and ask for that release time um, and, and, and see where it's going. Most administrators will hopefully privilege that learning and that initiative that you're taking to allow that to happen. Um, and you know what, if you can't find some someone in your school that um, is maybe on the same learning panel or in the lear same learning trajectory, it's always an option to say, I'm trying something new today. Would you like to come and join me and give me some feedback on what I'm trying? And I know that that takes courage the first or the second time, or maybe even the third time that you do it. But I think you will see that when your colleague sees the vulnerability that you're putting out there and the fact that you are open to feedback, it's a really amazing experience. Um, I think they respect that. And I think the students do as well. Yeah. Um, the interesting part is that when Trish, Trish and I uh, do this um, is that the students see it and we're pretty transparent with the students as well. I'll say, I'm trying this for the first time. I've asked Ms. Mecker to come in and give me some feedback so she can help me figure out how I could improve this new thing. And, um, and then we ask the students as well. And that's really empowering and engaging and modeling that growth mindset. Deanna's just saying that unfortunately this time uh, it is an OT, this is a really special special um, time right now. So yeah, the OT shortage might be might be a problem. Um, it would be it would be wonderful if they could even give you a coverage once before you go though, but I understand that that's a challenge. We're having difficulties with that too. Um, so shall we um, maybe um, get to the gist of this, right? Um, so uh, we just wanted to um, somehow summarize the really big learnings that came. And we thought that this diagram uh, could do a good job with that. We noticed that our learnings from UP Math, it was really broken down into two categories. So there was an emotional component, and we alluded to that with the quote that we started with. And there's also a cognitive component to learning and engagement. Um, we already spoke about gratitude and how that helps with the emotional component. Um, stuff like Padlets, like we started here, are in, in our classrooms. We also sometimes, and it might seem hokey, but the kids really enjoyed it, build gratitude trees. So trees on the wall where they each put something they're grateful for on it. Um, they did iMovies. They did all sorts of things so that we could really honor the fact that we wanted to take time to think about what we were grateful for because that process allowed us to change what was happening in our brain so we could take ownership of that and change the way we were thinking. So students being transparent, um, 
being high school s- teachers, that they actually have some degree of control over that and they can make choices and decisions that help them to improve the way that um, they're managing their anxiety. We had something called classroom coaches as well, uh, which was just something where a student who had worked hard and developed an increased aptitude for something, they could be honored um, and indicated that they were the classroom coach for a particular concept that we were studying. We would post these on the wall. And that again was ownership of learning, a feeling of pride. Some of these students, some of our students, have never really been honored and placed in positions of leadership in a classroom. So this was a really simple way to do it. And of course, the overall growth mindset that I'm sure that most of us are familiar with, the fact that they understand that they aren't there yet, that it's good to make mistakes, mistakes help our brain to grow, and that learning that growth mindset is absolutely imperative to becoming the best version of themselves as a student. Trish, do you want to talk about the cognitive? So when it came to the cognitive side of learning, we realized that, and it's part of growth mindset also, that in order to be successful, most students just needed more time. Um, It wasn't that they weren't capable. It's just they needed more time to make those connections. And once they were given that more time, and and we've all tried this in, in many different ways by offering extra help before and after school or even at lunch. Um, some of our some of our boards might be offering head start programs. All of these involve giving the students more time. And when they have that time, students did make those connections, okay? And once they made those connections, that led to increased achievement, right? Um, Our UP math program, because it was an entire credit that the student took um, first first semester of their grade nine year, it had the advantage of giving these students more time. Um, But once the course was over, um, we found students back in their whatever course um, still requiring that time, but the course just didn't allow for that, right? So we started to think about How can we take our strategies from our UP math program and implement them into our other courses? And we did do that, okay? We we started to, like we've already mentioned, we we do gratitude, we do growth mindset and coaches in all of our courses. Um, But there was still a dissonance between what we were saying in growth mindset about um, a student's potential to learn, okay? or um, or their ability to learn from mistakes. There was a dissonance between what we were saying in the emotional side of learning and our assessment and evaluation practices. Um, So this was a huge, huge learning for us, right? We had a program that was, was being very successful for our grade nine students, but we wanted to see that carry over and we thought we needed to merge Um, the emotional and cognitive side of learning. If we were going to really honor growth mindset, we needed to give students the time to make those connections um, in our other courses. um, And the way that we, we thought we could do that is with our assessment and evaluation practices. Um, We needed to implement assessment practices that valued mistakes, okay, as a critical part of learning and give students multiple opportunities to actually learn from their mistakes and show their improved knowledge. Uh, We also, right, as growing success tells us, one of the most important statements in growing success is we needed to implement assessment practices where the primary purpose of those practices was to improve student learning, put the student in the driver's seat of their achievement. Um, So we implemented practices that allowed students um, to identify areas where they still needed to grow. And then we provided them the structures um, that would allow them to do that growth. 
we think it all comes down to providing students an opportunity to own their learning. So ownership of learning is really, really a big part of what we came up with from the UP program and trying to spread our UP program into our other courses. And I, oh, sorry, go ahead, Trish. Go ahead. Uh, I, I don't know if you're going to say this, but that whole overlap of those things, um, the idea that without that, it was so much less effective, right? And we really didn't realize for quite a long time that this was the missing piece. And I, I can't stress that more. Uh, we have worked um, for, for quite a few years now, and part of our NORCAN project that Peter spoke about was bringing together schools from Norway, Alberta, and Ontario. And it was amazing because people all over the world are struggling with this same idea. How can we actually implement assessment and evaluation practices that honor the growth mindset, the emotional and cognitive needs. So just as a recap, okay, of what we've kind of been <laughs> talking about, um, the UP MOAC program um, told us that given enough time and proper supports, everyone can learn. We know that mindset is critical in, in um, both terms of the, the student and the teacher. That's an interesting part there, Trish, yeah. about the mindset of the teacher. Um, I think that uh, we focused so long on mindset of the student, but the teacher realizing that by their learning, that's actually one of the most impactful changes that can happen in a classroom. And the fact that you're all here learning um, indicates that that mindset is present. I think the big turning point for us was actually being transparent with our students about the fact that we are learning. And I know, as Deanna said, it's hard to get together now, but when that can happen, um, something called collective teacher efficacy is, is fostered, is nurtured. And that is one of the most impactful ways to make change in the classroom. And it's one of John Hattie's who, who ranks all of these, one of his top um, sort of go-tos. And that's the ability, the understanding, collective teacher efficacy is the understanding that for ourselves as teachers, by trying to learn, we can help our students to learn better. It's that mindset, that reflective um, perspective, I suppose. Sorry, Trish, don't get me off track. <laughs> I'm, I'm just checking the chat right now and I'm realizing yeah. that there's a bunch of messages in there. Oh, so I apologize. Yeah. Um, can you hear me better now? Um, I don't see them for some reason. Um, I think they're messages directly to me. That's why. Oh, okay. Okay. Do, so, do you have a paper over your microphone maybe? Because at one point I heard, I saw you move a paper and oh, I was shuffling over the mic. Okay. Yeah, I did have some papers there. Thank you, Peter. Oh, you're welcome. Is it better now, Peter? Yeah, it's quieter than it was before for some reason. Okay. 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 I apologize about that. I really do. I'm sorry about that. It's right. So we were continuing before I got us off track about mindset and teacher mindset. Um, we were continuing about the anxiety that can be limiting. So that's something that we we learned that we needed to deal with and that all students can be empowered to be leaders. OK, so when we took a look at our assessment practices, um, these are the strategies that we started to implement. And I really want to stress right now that this is still a work in progress, even though um, we have been working on it for several years. Um, each semester that goes by um, teaches us something new. Um, so here is where we are at this moment in time. And we're actually going to talk about that in terms of reporting marks to students. Also, we, we talk a lot about at this moment in time. Um, one of the shifts we made was from event based assessment to assessment that was criteria based. Um, what we mean by that is we were no longer reporting according to Cutica. So on a test, um, we weren't putting a knowledge mark and application mark. Um, on a test, we were reporting according to the learning goals of the course. 
and we'll talk about those learning goals. Um, we also um, started to implement and we're still, like I said, we're still changing day by day, semester by semester. Um, a moving towards mastery um, policy that allows students multiple opportunities to grow and show what they know, right? We really believe um, in students needing more time. So we talked about that being one of those cognitive needs. The way we, we thought our assessment practices could reflect that is having um, students possibly do reassessments after they've shown that they've improved their knowledge. Okay, we developed a learning map, which lists all the learning goals uh, for the course, and each student has a learning map in their binder so that they can set goals, right? If we're going to, we are going to encourage students to grow in their learning, they have to have a map of where they are and where they want to be, okay? All of our quizzes and uh, formative set of assessments all became gradeless, so students really really focused on the feedback that was given. Um, and that feedback we gave was always actionable. And the last thing that we did is we started to have formal um, great conferences with the students. So here's an example of some learning goals. Trish mentioned those already. And basically how we do this for a course is we look at, of course, the curriculum document. And we try to create some goals in student-friendly language. And then we try to make sure that those goals are transparent to our students. So it's just, this is actually a picture of, a, of, a, of the wall in one of our classrooms. Uh, we pretty much just print them out and post them up there. And then when we're actually doing our learning and expert exploration, we make reference to them. Um, the really good part, one of the great parts about this, in my opinion, is that the students see that they are actually working toward a fixed target. This is not something that myself as the teacher, Trish as the teacher, is changing as we go. We have a fixed target, so they can actually make a plan to get there. We also think that it changes the ownership. Um, this is not my goal for them. This is the province's goal for them. And we are the coach to help them get there. So creating those learning goals, I think, was a really, really important first step in terms of moving towards change in our, in our assessment practices. And guys, if you have questions, please like unmute yourself and ask or put it in the chat and ask whatever you feel comfortable with. But I think we're just going to go through and hit those criteria that uh, Trish shared, right, Trish? Yeah. And then we're, we're going to do some get into some breakout rooms and share a little bit more. Um, before, like with our learning goals, uh, it was always like it shouldn't be a secret to the students. We're really working on transparency too. Like th there, there shouldn't be any surprises. This is is your goal in terms of um, um, mastering the course, and so we refer to these learning goals all of the time when we do an investigation, when we do a lesson, whatever it may be. This is what we hope to learn, and this is the goal of our learning for for that lesson. Um, the next thing so, I'm going to show you, is, go ahead, Leanne. No, I was just going to say, we just had a request to look at the learning map. Okay. Go ahead, Trish. <laughs> and, and I might repeat myself, but some of the things that, that we've learned, um, have really, really evolved, right? That, um, we, we model that for our students all of the time that we continually reflect on what we are doing and um, adapt to the students' um, needs at that point in time, right? So this learning map has taken many different forms and, and we've presented it a number of times, but um, what it does is, and I don't know if I can use my cursor. Leanne, can you see my cursor right now as I'm pointing to different parts or not really? <laughs> no, I can't. We do have a question as well. Um, uh, Linda is wondering if we ever create the learning goals with students or they are set by ourselves before the learning takes place. Um, I think we, we've looked at, we've tried this a number of ways, haven't we, Trish? At the very beginning, yes. um, there was some um, co-creation of learning goals. Um, what we've 
what my personal um, takeaway from that, and I don't know if you can speak to this, Trish, and maybe Linda can too, um, was that we were really trying to make sure that students owned the learning so that these goals were our ministry guidelines. Um, and so we were trying to make them, I think, Trish, almost yeah. that's our goal. That's kind of our, our, our go-to target at the whole. And so we didn't, we didn't, um, discuss them as as options or or we didn't develop them I, I do see the advantage of that sort of thinking though too yeah yeah but it this this process um um takes a bit of time for you to look at your curriculum and we've gone both ways with this we have um this is just a sample of our learning map and the learning goals. Um, the grade nine new math curriculum is quite extensive in the number of uh, curriculum expectations there are. Um, so we've we've struggled with making our learning goals um, very specific, or not very specific, but specific and actionable, as opposed to making them um, a broader, okay, um, and we have, we've gone back and forth. After teaching a course several times, we've kind of meshed some learning goals in together um, to to better address the needs of our students, right? Um, so I'm just going to address. There's some questions in here. What does ATM grade stand for? Um, so the parts of the learning map are the learning goal would be here on the left hand side, and like I said, this is just a um, snapshot of our grade nine math D, or grade nine D streamed math um, learning map. Okay, we have our continuum of learning in the middle here that we encourage students to use for any formative assessment or self assessment. Um, so our, our we mentioned that we're doing gradeless check ins right, um, we still do um, written type quizzes, um, but we have um, avoided putting any grades on that. Um, so we just indicate or we have students self assess where are you in achieving this learning goal? And we made it very um, simple. I'm not yet there. I'm getting there or I got it. So this middle section of the learning map, um, map is where they um, record their formative assessment. Okay. Now this side, ATM stands for at this moment grade. Um, so whenever a students do a formal assessment, they will get that is a formal assessment on a particular learning goal, they will get an ATM grade for that learning goal. And the reason why there are multiple boxes here is because if it's at at this moment grade, we are saying that when students improve their learning and show us that improved learning, that mark will change to what their new knowledge reflects. Um, uh, Trish, we're also getting a question. We had a question about ATM, also the um, T1, N2, S2, et cetera. Um, those are um, labels that we actually created. We know that when we look in curriculum documents, it's all it's often A1, A11, A12, et cetera. Um, so we do actually have some documents that kind of connect our labels to the curriculum labels uh, that are produced by the ministry. What we found though, is that these learning maps, as Trish is saying, are for the students so that they can articulate where they need to grow. So we needed to create some labels um, that they could try, they could actually remember a little bit easier. So the T1 goal, I think is our thinking goal yeah. that relates to a mathematical process. The end two goal is our number system. So it's under the overall goal of number system, which would have an N, and then we would number them. Uh, we found it to be important to actually have those short form numbers, though, because when the students are communicating with us, it was much easier for them to say, um, I need help with this concept. But if they're messaging us about a potential moving toward mastery or reassessment that we're going to speak about, it's easy for them to have that label. 
There's another question in the chat about the A team. Uh -huh. Are they actual grade uh -huh. or levels? Mm -hmm. um, so we do um, on, um, um, let's say the first uh, comprehensive assessment on a set of learning goals, we do give percentage grades. We do give percentage grades. And that happens on our comprehensive assessments, which is like our tests, whereas on what would traditionally be quizzes that we would call checkpoints, that's when they receive the feedback, the written feedback, and they're given uh, a mark on the, uh, not a mark, a placement on the continuum, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. whether they're not yet there, getting there, or they've got it. Yeah. And we're gonna um, show something you else. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Trish. We're going to show you some of the things that Leanne yeah. was mentioning, but we also wanted to today give you an opportunity to let us know what you want to learn more about. Um, so, um, yes, please keep asking the questions because it'll direct what we do in, in, in the rest of the session and maybe the next session. Um, something else I wanted to mention, Trish, was we're using these words like comprehensive assessment yeah. and checkpoints instead of quizzes and tests as we as what is what I would have called it initially. Um, and the reason for that is that we realize that our students have very preconditioned ideas about what assessment and evaluation is. So we really felt that we needed to change the language because we wanted to change their thinking about assessment and evaluation. We wanted them to feel a sense of ownership. And many of our students students did not have that feeling of ownership. They felt that they would do something for us. The teacher was in full control of what the grade was going to be. It was as it was at that moment, and they didn't feel empowered at all. So that was part of our plan to try to change that so that students would start to think about assessment and evaluation in a much, much different way. Um, so the reflecting and goal setting um, that we spoke about, um, this does take time. You guys are all uh, teachers, you know that. Sitting down with students and actually having conversations is very time consuming. What we've come to realize that the value of that is incalculable. Um, getting their voice in that, helping them to look at their learning maps and together figuring out how they're going to set some goals so as to try to remediate any of the numeracy gaps that they're experiencing that their assessment showed exist and and that's just such an important aspect of this uh, we're looking for what recommendations might you suggest for applying this process to teaching classes that take place once per week I think that this this could work just in the same way to be honest um, and I think that as we go through maybe Trish and finish up with this and maybe get into some rooms that we can chat about that a little bit more yeah um one more thing we wanted to show you just to kind of pull all the pieces together here. So this would be the last page of a comprehensive assessment, um, like a test that a student took. So you can see that um, each of the learning goals is listed and the questions that assess that learning goal are also listed. And then, yes, it was asked whether we give a level or a percentage grade, we would put their percentage grade for each learning goal on that last page of the test. If, if the grades that we are given are going to be actionable. If students can actually um, learn from the assessment that's taken place, we believe that they have to be tied to a learning goal. Um, and that's just something that we've had success with. Students can look at this and maybe if I had filled this in, maybe one of their grade or a uh, there's a number of their grades that are, are um, 85, 75, whatever it may be, but they're still struggling with just one concept. So by reporting for each learning goal, the students can say, yeah, I have achieved this learning goal and this learning goal, but I still need to work on that, on, on uh, one learning goal, yeah. 
Sorry. I think a big part of that learning, though, too, Trish, um, was that when we originally, you know, our, our original training and our development over the last probably 15 years ago was we were always reporting using Cutica, so the knowledge, understanding, application, thinking, and communication. And what we realized that by providing feedback to our students, by, by providing grades in that way, that wasn't actionable. And so we needed to change that. We did have initial qualms because we were kind of doing something different, but then we realized when we looked at the curriculum, regardless of the course, that those um, categories of learning, the thinking, the communication, are actually embedded directly in the curriculum expectations. So as long as we were true to what the curriculum was, we were automatically covering the knowledge, the application, the thinking. Um, we actually feel like this is more true to the curriculum. Um, years ago, it was, okay, we're going to give knowledge a certain percentage of the grade, same thing with application and such. But those were all just random numbers. And they didn't even really reflect um, the proportion of those types of learning goals or, or expectations that were in the curriculum. So I think that doing this with your assessment, to me, this is really something that can help students to feel like they have con better control of their learning and that they are able to set some goals for themselves. I, I can't say how much I think this makes a difference. Yeah. Uh, we just went through parent teacher conferences last week and it is it's new for the some of the parents that we were going through and i can't tell you how many comments i had um because student or teacher sorry parents would ask well what can they do to improve their grade and i'm like well the student has their learning map in front of them. They're already working towards improving their grade. They know where they're still struggling. They come in for that extra help. Um, they do some more work with that. They do some more practice with that. And then they, they make an appointment with us or they come in for in a morning and they say, I want to show you that I've um, improved my knowledge of this. And shouldn't we be giving students the ownership to do that? Our hope is that you're going to build your own collaborative network uh, going forward wherever possible. We know the conditions are pretty challenging uh, this year. Uh, we also know, however, that we're going to have some time together again uh, towards the end of the month if, if we um, go forward into our, our next session as well. So Trish and I really wanted to gather your feedback for what you want to learn more about. So as we were in the breakout rooms, we did make some notes on that. Um, we'd also um, like you to give us our formal so that we can take this away. So Trish has, Trish has pulled up um, a QR code. I'm also going to put a link in our chat that will take you to this. It's another example of a Mentimeter um, that will ask you um, exactly where you would like us to focus next time around. So if you wouldn't mind uh, pulling that together, that would be really helpful. And then... Um, Trish, I think you're muted. I was muted. <laughs> um, I was just thinking also, I don't think we've put our email addresses into this presentation. <laughs> so um, I can do that. It, would that be possible that the, if you'd be provided to the participants? No, I've got um, okay, perfect. Okay, there they are. Okay. Thank you. Awesome. Um, it's also the uh, the Menti link. If you if you don't mind clicking away at that, that would be wonderful. And uh, that way we can ensure that our next learning actually directly responds to what you want to learn more about. We're also hoping that um, if there's anything that you're able to try um, in the time that we are apart, um, if you want to make some notes on it, if you want to collect any. Um, anecdotes or video or data, whatever, whatever you feel might capture um, something that you wanted to try and, and, and maybe some results that you found, whether it worked, whether it didn't, and that sort of thing. The other thing we did was we created a Google Drive folder, and Leanne's going to put that link into the chat. Um, 
It is in its very early primitive stages right here. Um, we can add to it whatever you want to learn more about. And we encourage you also to add to it. Uh, maybe you've tried something and you've shared that with us or shared it with um, people in your breakout room and wouldn't mind sharing that with everyone by just putting it into the Google Drive um, folder there. Um, Based on some of the things that I heard in the breakout rooms that um, I was in, um, we will, um, um, I'll start to populate that with some of our, our work with reassessment policy. I had uh, one of the group breakout rooms was asking, so what is your policy about that? Um, the learning goals, the learning map. Um, we can add to that as you require, just let us know. So what are we thinking? Um, any, any questions or comments? There was something um, talking about a student, um, a picture of a learning map. Um, yep. uh, Lisa, are you meaning what it looks like once it's filled in in, student, in terms of a student pick or just the general document? Yeah, a just, just, just a student picture. Like, hey, you've got check marks and you've got some grades okay. to show how their grades should be improving, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. I think that that... Perfect. And yeah. I think, Trish, that's something we could add to next time as well. Um, yes. Just sure. an, an actual, the process of the mechanics in terms of how that evolves, because there it, it is quite a process. Looks like yeah. Peter has written um, or, or posted a form as well. Um, so Peter, you're wanting them to give that a click as well? Yep, I just have a few uh, slides to share, so. Okay, uh, okay. I'm gonna yep. sharing, yep. Okay, so um, thanks so much. Um, <laughs> where were you guys at the beginning of my career? Seriously. <laughs> you know, when I started teaching, I had just come from industry and um, hadn't been to teacher's college yet because I was hired straight, straight from industry and I was teaching electronics and I went to the, the old timer electronics teacher and I said, hey, do you have like an old exam or a course outline? Like I didn't want his binder. I wasn't asking for his binder. And, and he said to me, when I was young, I had to do it on my own, oh. <laughs> you to do it on your own. And he wouldn't share a single thing with me. And I swore from that moment on, anything that I ever developed, I would share. Mm -hmm. So it was remarkable when tools like, like wikis came out. So I don't know if you remember the early mm -hmm. wikis. I do. I was an early adopter and I was asked to go to Atlanta to present on wikis. And I was down there and my very last slide was a half day workshop. And the very last slide was, okay, now that we've spent a lot of time learning about wikis, wikis are dead. Because with wikis, he who saves last wins. <laughs> you understand? If there's two people editing, whoever saves last wipes yeah. out the other person's edits, right? Oh. And I said, there's a new product that's out there now and it's going to transform the way that you do things and you won't be using wiki websites anymore. And that new product is Rightly. Anybody know what Rightly is? No. So Rightly got purchased no. very quickly by a company called Google and it became Google Docs. Uh, which completely transformed collaboration. Yeah. I was so excited because if you think about it, many, many teachers, they go into the classroom, they close the door, they do their own thing and they don't realize, or maybe they do and they don't care that there are, thousands, well, maybe not thousands, hundreds of other teachers doing the exact same kinds of things. So why don't we share? Why don't we collaborate? You know, and it's mostly because teachers, I think, are afraid, afraid to expose their mistakes to the mm. world, right? They're afraid to be shown up and um, which is too bad. We should just share and build up upon each other's products. Mm. And, uh, and it's so nice to see that in the last decade, that's really been catching on and we're starting to see mm. a lot more collaboration. And it's truly wonderful to see like you two actually wanting to be at the same school together to work on projects together. That's wonderful. So this was really engaging. I'll, I'll share, share more stories after we stop recording. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you so much. Um, for everybody, um, you're going to be receiving a follow-up email, um, hopefully tomorrow. It'll have a link to the evaluation form again, in, in case you don't have a chance to fill it in tonight. 
Also a link to the uh, the slides, which I will have to get from the two of you, please. Yep. Um, and then a link to the recording. Okay, and that'll be, uh, I believe it's on their YouTube channel. And let's see here. So the evaluation forms, I've already dropped the link in into the chat, uh, which I will do one more time, just in case anybody missed it. And then just a reminder that uh, this is now, this was the fourth, I believe, out of about 10 different webinars that, we are, that we're hosting. Um, you obviously know, you know where to register for them. Uh, it's the, just, if you just do a Google search for OTF Connects and find the calendar, they're all shown there. And the next one we have is this coming Thursday, uh, Building Nature Connections, How to Organize an Eco Fair at Your School with uh, uh, Michael Frankfurt. Uh, very interesting. Yeah. Um, Anyway, I hope to see some of you there or at some of the other ones. So thank you so much. And that concludes our webinar. I, I, thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you for your participation today. We look forward to seeing you again. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Take care, Peter. Hi to, every, hi to the OTF team. Oh, I will. I'm actually meeting with them tomorrow. Oh, I miss you guys. We miss you. <laughs> All right. Take care. See you, Linda.